It's the 1950s and 60s. Baby boomers are bursting onto the American scene with a surge of energy. Social revolution is in the air. But another kind of revolution is emerging, a technical revolution destined to touch the lives of virtually every person on the planet. Man was preparing to travel to the moon, and computers were designed to help him crunch the numbers to get there. In fact, systems were being developed that could perform all kinds of functions. Very few were thinking as far ahead as the year 2000. Even the forward-thinking computer programmers and those who employed them were stretching to envision the next decade, let alone the next millennium. Storing information was very expensive. So to save space and money, programmers shortened the date code by using only two digits instead of four. 1970 became 70, 1971, 71, and so on. At the time, it seemed like a great idea. Until recently, virtually every computer on the planet contained this two-digit year code that, in a few months from now, will read the year 2000 as 00. This double zero, unless fixed, will be processed as 1900 in many cases, or will not be understood at all. And that is a big problem. It's a simple problem, but so widespread that experts say there's just not enough time to fix it completely. It should have been addressed years ago, and now time is running out. The countdown is being declared by days, hours, minutes, and seconds on Internet sites around the world. Even though we don't often think about it, computers play a part in almost every aspect of our lives, from water and power to buying food, from paychecks to telephones, credit cards to pensions. Computers are responsible for our 21st century lifestyle, a lifestyle that could be affected by what some people call the Millennium Bug, also known as Y2K. On January 1, year 2000, date-sensitive computer data and computer chips could malfunction and impact many aspects of our society. In the words of the space program, Houston, we have a problem. Hello, I'm Robert Stack. There are many things in our world that are confusing and unknown. Often facts are hidden to intentionally keep the authorities and the public from finding the truth. In most of these cases, a crime has been committed, and the investigators must painstakingly unravel the available clues to determine what actually took place. The outcome is clear, but the cause is undetermined. In this report, I will address something that is just the opposite. I submit that a crime has not been purposely committed, but the situation could be just as serious, as you'll discover. We will attempt to unravel a mystery where the cause is clear, but the outcome is uncertain, and the outcome could be serious. It's the year 2000 computer problem, a technical uncertainty that could affect more than just computers, it could impact each one of us right where we live and work. Many people wonder, is this a real problem, one we need to understand and address? There are some people just trying to capitalize on a perceived crisis to advance their own agenda. We'll let you decide, as together we investigate the facts surrounding this challenge for the 21st century. Mankind historically exhibits anxiety and irrational human behavior when the calendar passes from one century to another. That magical date change has brought out the best and the worst in people. Changing from one millennium to another magnifies the event, creating an even greater level of anticipation. James Reston Jr. wrote about the beginning of our current millennium in his book, The Last Apocalypse, Europe at the Year 1000 A.D. Taking us back in time, he says. And so we enter the world of 999 AD, when the Christian calendar is about to turn four digits. The pace seems to quicken, the heart beats faster, 
and passions seem to grow stronger and more urgent. It can be a time of anxiety, but also of creativity, a time of extravagance, but also a time to take stock, to prepare for what is unknown but felt nonetheless. For some, faith is heightened, for all the anticipation is great. There is about this hinge of time an odd and unsettling mix of sobriety and celebration. Today, 1,000 years later, the human condition hasn't changed much, especially in light of Y2K. We have everything from optimists to doomsdayers, from alarmists to those in denial, from concerned activists to others who are oblivious. History tells us that soon after the passing of the year 1000, the world changed drastically. And now as we approach the next millennium, things are about to change again. We know date certain that a global computer crisis will occur, only its severity remains to be determined. It is not a question of one thing going wrong, but tens of thousands of things going awry. The ultimate impact on society will depend on two unknowns. Number one, how much progress is made between now and January 1st, 2000. And number two, how people will respond in advance to the possibility of major disruptions in their lives. Right now, governments and businesses are spending hundreds of billions of dollars in an attempt to prevent or at least minimize a crisis. With those kinds of dollars being spent, we know there is a significant cause for concern. Experts agree that it's not a question of if it will happen. It's a question of how serious it might be. So what is the problem, and what can we do about it? It's not one, but a series of problems involving computer hardware, software, and data. Arthur Capers Jones reveals the scope of the challenge by writing. This is almost unique in human history. There never has been a man-made technical problem that will impact so many businesses, so many government groups, and cause so many problems at a personal level. When the 20th century ends, many applications will either stop working or produce erroneous results since their logic cannot accept the transition when the dates change from 99 to double zero. The problem will not go away if ignored. Failure to correct it could lead to serious consequences. You see, it's a simple problem. It can be fixed. But experts tell us there's simply not enough time to fix it all by January 1, 2000. Dr. Edward Yardini is chief economist and managing director at Deutsche Morgan Grenfell and before that, also as chief economist for C.J. Lawrence, Prudential Securities, and E.F. Hutton. Barron's called him the Wall Street wizard. Institutional investors said he is one of the 20 most important players on the financial web. He is also a favorite on Wall Street Week and CNN's Moneyline. Today, he will talk about the global economic consequences of Y2K. I'm not a doomsdayer. I don't, I'm not talking about the end of life on the planet Earth. But, but I agree with what has been said so far. If we continue to pretend there isn't a problem coming, doomsday scenarios are conceivable. And we have to stop that. We have to make sure there isn't panic. We have to tell the public, you know, some things you depend on may simply not work. There are no contingency plans, by the way, for IT failure. You can't go back and do things manually or by paper. That was already ob observed. So we, the contingency plans is to prepare people for the fact that certain product services and information that they really needed aren't going to be available. You're going to have to conduct your business, your life, without some things for a while. Federal Reserve Chairman Alan Greenspan confirms that we could face a major problem ahead. During a congressional testimony, he admitted that we don't know how big the problem is, but we must do whatever it takes to reduce the amount of damage it's going to do. He then reflected on his days as a computer program and admitted, I'm one of the culprits who created the problem. I used to write those programs back in the 60s and 70s and was so proud of the fact that I was able to squeeze a few elements of space out of my program by not having to put one nine before the year. It never entered our minds that those programs would have lasted more than a few years. As we look back, it seems preposterous that so many could be so short-sighted. How could this happen? Who is ultimately responsible? The fact is no one person is to blame. Everyone involved felt that we or they would fix it as we got closer to the deadline. But nobody did. And here we are. What became a computer industry standard 
has now become society's Achilles heel. The Federal Reserve Bank is right now preparing contingency plans. They announced recently that they will be increasing U.S. cash reserves for 1999 by a full one-third, from $150 to $200 billion. U.S. Federal Reserve Board Governor Edward Kelly. The Federal Reserve is closely monitoring year 2000 preparations at the institutions we supervise so that we can act aggressively to identify and resolve problems. We are well along toward meeting our objective of examining every bank subject to our authority. Like our counterparts in the private sector, the Federal Reserve still faces substantial challenges in achieving year 2000 readiness. Dr. Yardeni is aggressively raising awareness among those in the financial community. He has said, in recent discussions with institutional money managers in Minneapolis, Chicago, and New York, I was amazed at how many of them believe that somebody will find a silver bullet solution before the immovable deadline. Many assured themselves by telling me, Bill Gates will find a solution. Don't count on it, he said. Their position is a single technology provider cannot solve all the issues related to the transition to the year 2000. No one person or company can fix this one. Its magnitude and pervasive nature defy any single solution. Every advanced electronic system on the planet must be assessed. It has the potential to affect the very foundations of our governmental system. Even if one agency is successful in updating their systems to 100% compliance, they still may not be safe because of the interconnectivity factor. For example, the Department of Defense has shifted largely from dedicated defense communication systems to commercial networks. So if the telephone system fails, the DOD could have some serious challenges beyond their control. A similar problem plagues the Internal Revenue Service, who depends on the Treasury Department to complete its tasks. Their systems are interconnected. IRS Commissioner Charles O. Rosati told the Wall Street Journal, there's no point in sugarcoating the problem. If we don't fix the century date problem, we will have a situation scarier than the average disaster movie. There could be 90 million taxpayers who won't get their refunds. 95% of the revenue stream of the United States could be jeopardized. General Accounting Office spokesman Keith Rhodes. I am not a doomsday scenario person. I am, not, I am uh, as Dr. Yardini uh, states, and, and as uh, Mr. De Jager says, I am an alarmist. You have, you have to take uh, seriously this problem. Uh, doomsday means there's no solution. Contingency planning may be your only option at this moment. We understand from uh, some of the panel members and well, as well as other people we deal with outside, there are billion dollar corporations that are just now starting to move into what's called awareness. They're just trying to figure out that there is a Y2K problem. Um, that organization has to go to plan Z right now. Uh, they, don't, they don't have the time to fiddle around with this. Year 2000 cuts all the way across the organization. It will affect your heating system. It will affect your, your door locks. It will affect your cryptographic equipment. It will affect a whole lot of things in your, in your environment, as well as your credit rating. Arthur Gross, the former chief information officer for the IRS, who resigned in April of 1998, was quoted as saying, failure to achieve compliance with year 2000 will jeopardize our way of living on this planet for some time to come. The IRS is painfully aware of the problem and is working hard to correct it. Mr. Gross revealed just how serious they are when he noted that in 1996, the Y2K program at the IRS consisted of only three people and a $20 million budget. Two years later, there were 600 people on the project with a budget projection reaching $900 million. He then added, I think it is rather interesting that a number of government and private sector agencies are proclaiming a Y2K success when we know full well that it is preposterous. Dr. Yardini expressed concern that some of our top policymakers in charge of the government's Y2K efforts are minimizing the risk of significant Y2K disruption to avoid panicking the public. He said, these officials know that a great deal is at risk and they know that some vitally important computer systems will probably fail in 2000. He then added, 
Alarm now is far better than panic in a year. By keeping silent on the potential deep disruptive impact that Y2K may have on the public, government officials are increasing the odds of a panic reaction and aberrant survivalist behavior. Until recently, mainstream reports about Y2K have been somewhat scarce, the internet being the main source of information. However, people in places of authority are now giving credence to the issue. U.S. President Bill Clinton has finally spoken out about Y2K in a speech at the National Academy of Sciences. I came here today because I wanted to stress the urgency of the challenge to people who are not in this room. The consequences of the millennium bug, if not addressed, could simply be a rash of annoyances, like being unable to use a credit card at the supermarket. It could affect electric power, phone service, air travel, major governmental service. With millions of hours needed to rewrite billions of lines of code and hundreds of thousands of interdependent organizations, this is clearly one of the most complex management challenges in history. All told, the worldwide cost will run into the tens, perhaps the hundreds of billions of dollars. And that's the cost of fixing the problem, not the cost if something actually goes wrong. Every business of every size, with eyes wide open, must face the future and act. But comments aren't limited to the executive branch of the federal government. Others are equally concerned. To those of you who might think this is a little overblown, for us to talk about the crisis, I would refer you to the Fortune magazine article that makes it clear that if Y2K were to hit this coming weekend, General Motors could not produce a single car in any one of their 157 manufacturing plants. And when people say to me, is the world going to come to an end, I say, I don't know. I don't know whether this will be a bump in the road that's the most optimistic assessment of what we've got, a fairly serious bump in the road, or whether this will, in fact, trigger a major worldwide recession with absolutely devastating economic consequences in some parts of the world. We must be Paul Revere. We must tell everyone that the British indeed are coming, or in this case, Y2K is coming. But we must not be chicken little. The internet is replete with articles about Y2K, many painting very frightful scenarios. But there are a number of credible websites that provide objective reporting. Vic Poirier explains how difficult it is to describe what's really going on. He writes, It is a political fact of life that contemporary politics is media-driven. And so far, the media has failed to serve the electorate with regard to Y2K. The problem is strangely invisible and at the same time, devilishly complex. Not something that lends itself to sound bites, one page summaries, or five minute explanations. The year 2000 will bring a degree of nasty turbulence, technologically, economically, socially, and politically. On the eve of World War II, Winston Churchill told the British House of Commons, owing to past neglect, in face of the plainest warnings, we have now entered upon a period of danger. The era of procrastination, of half measures, of delays is coming to its close. In its place, we are entering a period of consequences. We cannot avoid this period. We are in it now. Mr. Parlier concludes, as for Y2K, we are all in it now, with only months to go. In spite of all this information from credible sources, it's hard to believe that something like this could be true. Surely if we can send people to the moon, we can fix this. Man's history of overcoming seemingly impossible challenges has given us an immeasurable spirit of optimism and a belief that we can solve anything. But naive optimism can be dangerous and denial a treacherous bedfellow. It's because of naive optimism and denial that most corporate and government leaders have waited so long to address this problem. And it's denial that could keep each of us from being as prepared as we should be. We must remain optimistic, but we must be prudent and prepared. None of us can afford to put our heads in the sand, especially those in a position of leadership. 
anyone can fall prey to denial. It's human nature to assume it's all just an exaggeration. Peter de Jaeger, special advisor to the United Kingdom Year 2000 Task Force, warns us about becoming too complacent. When they use a graphic of a plane falling out of the sky, that's hype and that's exaggeration. But underneath all of the hype and exaggeration are some hard facts about year 2000, which no rational human being can ignore. Let me reiterate something that Senator Bennett said. If today were December the 31st, 1999, and our systems were in the current state they are in today, tomorrow our economy worldwide would stop. It wouldn't grind to a halt. It would snap to a halt. You would not have dial tone tomorrow if tomorrow were January the 1st, year 2000. You would not have air travel. You would not have Federal Express. You would not have the Postal Service. You would not have uh, water. You would not have power because the systems are broken. I know you don't like hearing it. I know it is classed as hype and exaggeration. The problem is it happens to be a fact which you yourself can verify. David E. Baker of the Schwab Washington Research Group, testifying before a subcommittee for the House Ways and Means Committee, said because of the tremendous liabilities and threat of litigation, there is an absolute silence from corporate America on year 2000 preparations. Alan Simpson of Communication Links agrees. Uh, I met with John Piscotton at the White House yesterday and we were running through the problems that he had. And the problems that he had is the same as the Senate, Senator Bennett's the same, no one is telling 100% of the truth. Everyone is frightened about their stock position. Everyone is frightened about their credit rating. And so, oh yes, we'll, be, we'll reach 2,000. The seemingly simple computer problem may be more pervasive than we first realized. When things fail, we will be facing multiple overlapping failures. We will not be facing isolated events. We're talking about an event like a UPS strike, like a loss of power, like the stock market crash, like the recession, like the current gridlock with Union Pacific and Southern Pacific, all happening simultaneously. There is another problem that could be bigger than even the failure of computers and software, embedded chips. These are silicon chips, like microprocessors, timers, sequencers, and controllers that exist in everything from weapon systems and manufacturing facilities to consumer electronics. Permanently coded software that allows these chips to operate is sometimes date sensitive and cannot easily be changed. Most have to be replaced. Many times the entire device containing the chip has to be replaced. This is a tedious and costly process, and sometimes can't be done without severely disrupting business. Peter de Jaeger confirms this point. We have a problem even bigger than the software problem. It's bigger, we have no idea how much bigger, we have no idea really how much the impact is going to be. We have an embedded system problem. And anybody who says that we don't have enough evidence about embedded system problems should pay attention to General Motors. They are not a consulting group, I'm sure you're aware. They described as their problem as catastrophic. Their words, not mine. They took a plant which they were going to shut down and instead of shutting it down, they rolled the clock forward. And when they rolled the clock forward, their assembly line, the robotics, stopped. They just stopped. Embedded chips are everywhere in office buildings, manufacturing plants, medical diagnostic equipment, in transportation, communications, and banking systems. Millions of mission-critical systems are at risk of disruption or failure, from medical equipment to national defense systems. The enormity of the problem is staggering. Devices will fail. We can't fix them all, so in many cases, the only realistic option is to let them fail, then scramble to bring systems back online as soon as possible. The challenge is, some of these systems could be critical to our health, well-being, and safety. 
A survey of 10 of the largest oil, gas, and electric utilities by a special U.S. Senate Y2K committee concluded that while these utilities are proceeding in the right direction, the pace is too slow and the milestone dates are so distant that there is significant cause for concern. None of the utilities surveyed had completed contingency plans. If the utilities don't have a plan B, where do we go for power? The consequences could be devastating. The National Rural Electric Cooperative Association stated in a U.S. Senate hearing that electricity cannot effectively be stored in large quantities. It must be created in real time to meet immediate needs. Y2K is a serious challenge for all electric utilities. The industry is working hard to ensure that the nation's electric supply is Y2K ready. In Canada as well, there is concern. According to an issue of the Ottawa Citizen, Tom Clark, Ontario Hydro's Year 2000 project leader, told a Canadian parliamentary committee that we have a lot of work to do. He said only approximately 40% of the utility's critical systems are Y2K compliant. I can't make you feel 100% confident that everything is going to function. David Gamble of the Parliamentary Bureau reported in CNews that Canada's National Defense Department is preparing for war against the year 2000 problem, a kind of martial law that will see soldiers, sailors, and air personnel play a major role in keeping Canada working. A national readiness exercise is expected in May or June of 1999, the orders say. The telecommunications industry is critical to our economic health and security. Think about all the things in your life that are connected to the telephone. First and most important is your family, then your job, buying with a credit card, making any electronic funds transfers, sending a fax or even using the internet. Phone service is critical to our way of life. Senator Bob Bennett. If the phones don't give you a dial tone, if there's no way to communicate information, the nation also will shut down. U.S. Federal Reserve Board Governor Edward W. Kelly Jr. stated in congressional testimony, I don't think we shall escape unaffected. We are especially sensitive to telecommunications. This is an area that many financial institutions regard as needing attention. Our advanced telecommunication systems wouldn't exist without embedded systems. We might not know until the year 2000 which ones will work and which ones won't. Bennett ranked transportation third after utilities and telecommunications on his list of areas to be addressed in priority levels. In commenting on transportation, he noted, immediately people think of the FAA but realize that all railroad traffic is computer controlled, and all raw materials in this country go by rail, as does the coal that fires the power plants. That takes us back up to the power grid. Medical equipment is another area of major concern when discussing the issue of embedded chips. As we all know, it is frequently involved in life or death situations. Emergency rooms and hospital floors are filled with apparatus that utilize embedded systems like infusion pumps, MRI scanners, ventilators, and many other vital life-sustaining units. A Federal Computer Week article revealed that many manufacturers that have supplied medical devices to Department of Veterans Affairs medical facilities have yet to respond to the agency's repeated requests for information about whether the devices are year 2000 compliant. Kenneth Kaiser. Under Secretary for Veterans Health at the VA said the VA's medical facilities have 855 models of devices and equipment that are not compliant, and about 20% of these will not be made compliant by the manufacturer. The government's Health Care Financing Administration, also known as HICFA, is the agency that processes all Medicare claims and payments. Administrator Nancy Ann Min DeParle said HICFA, which has been criticized for being behind schedule in fixing the year 2000 bug, is on track to meet his self-imposed December deadline for fixing the systems. The Powell said HICFA and his contractors are examining 49 million lines of systems codes. Let's hope they get it all fixed in time.
An independent study of New York City's infrastructure carried out by UK-based Corporation 2000 has estimated that the city faces massive disruption for up to a month at the start of the year 2000. This story was also covered in an issue of the Financial Times. New York City faces significant disruption at the turn of the century, despite being among the best prepared of the world's cities. We don't know yet how likely this scenario could be, but if it is, New York City isn't the only city we need to be concerned about. It's just one of the most obvious. There are hundreds of other major metropolitan areas in North America and around the world that could be facing these same kinds of challenges. As we enter the final months before these events unfold, a looking glass is still cloudy. With massive amounts of often conflicting information, it's impossible to accurately predict the future. As a result, those of us who are aware of the problem often find ourselves at a loss to know exactly how best to prepare. Worse yet, it appears that most people either don't know there's a problem or have yet to admit there could be an impact on their personal lives or community. Senator Bennett says public awareness is crucial. Let me say that the more I get into this issue, the more convinced I become that this is one of those sleeper issues that can um, rise up and bite us in ways that we have no anticipation of in advance. Because the more we can get uh, awareness of this issue going in the country in a responsible way, the better off the country and the world will be. CIO Magazine has completed a survey that indicates that more than a third of U.S. residents have never heard of the year 2000 bug. Of those who have, Four out of five shrug it off as a technical problem that technical types will no doubt solve before a crisis happens. If this were a Hollywood disaster movie, we could expect a happy ending without any personal involvement. In fact, as a society, we've been conditioned to expect that happy ending. But there won't be a happy ending if we don't prepare. And history teaches us we won't prepare if we don't believe it will be serious. According to a recent Gallup poll, 75% of small businesses haven't made any year 2,000 repairs yet, and 50% don't plan to act anytime soon. The polls showed only 6% view the problem as very serious. Writer Jim Lord gives us a great analogy. He has said, It's like knowing when a river will flood your town, but not being able to convince anyone to start stacking the one million sandbags needed to handle the floodwaters. The frustration is in knowing that if everyone would immediately address this problem, the damage could be greatly contained. Indeed, we are in deeper trouble every day that nothing is done. If we fall into a state of emergency, it will take years and years to fully recover. By the fall of 1999, it should be quite clear whether or not the government and businesses will be ready or not. At that point, we should be able to clearly anticipate most potential failures. Until then, we can only guess what will happen. Since no one really knows the severity of the problem and the degree of trickle-down disruptions, it will be necessary for you to do your own research and decide for yourself what you believe the impact will be. Then, plan accordingly. There are at least three scenarios that should be considered at this time. The first is the probability of disruptions for a few days. The majority of Y2K problems will most likely fall into this category, and this is a situation you can do something about. Your plan should be similar to preparing for a natural disaster in your area, one that would cause power outages and transmission problems. Make a list of what you will need. If the power goes out for two or three days, what are the things you should do now so you won't panic if that happens? Remember, this doesn't have to catch you by surprise you can be prepared. If you lose your heat and lighting, what will you do? Do you have candles or lanterns and some lamp oil? Do you have a fireplace and wood? Or lots of warm blankets or sleeping bags? Maybe a kerosene heater with a supply of fuel? If your refrigerator and freezer won't work, how will that affect your food supply? Do you have a backup plan? If your microwave and stove won't work, how will you heat things? Do you have food supplies that don't need to be heated? If water and sewers were affected, do you have adequate bottled water? It is also important to consider what you'll do if the toilets won't flush 
What are your alternatives? If the stores are closed and you can't get food, do you have non-perishable supplies on hand? If the pharmacies are closed and you can't get medicine, can you get an extra supply in advance, especially prescription drugs? If the ATM doesn't work and you can't get cash, in addition to your checking account, do you have any ready reserves? If the gasoline pumps don't work at the gas station because the power is sporadic, are you planning a trip during those holidays? Make a list of these things and develop a contingency plan. Prepare now so you won't tend to panic later. Make sure you have hard copies of all your important papers and contracts, from mortgages to billing statements, insurance policies to investment records, birth certificates, school records, anything that is important and could be lost or destroyed if data systems went haywire. You will need to be able to back up your personal and financial information in writing if company and government databases contain errors. Software is now available for assessing the Y2K compliance of your personal computer, whether used for business or at home. Don't wait until the last minute to check out your systems. Do it now. In addition, you need to be mentally prepared. If the phones don't work for a few days, have a plan worked out with those people close to you for contacting each other. If your TV doesn't work, do you have a battery-powered radio for emergency information? If the traffic signals don't work properly, decide to keep a level head and be careful about driving when you don't need to. If buses aren't operating, do you have an alternative form of transportation? If airplanes aren't flying, will that affect your work? Are you planning a trip over those holidays? you might want to reconsider. If your employer would have shut down for a few days, can you prepare during the last few days of December so you won't face a crisis? Or if you miss a paycheck or a government check, do you have enough reserves to make it through a month without that income? Preparing for this kind of situation isn't difficult and doesn't require a lot of money. If you live in an area where there's a possibility of frequent natural disasters, you are probably ready for this scenario already. Get together with some of your friends and talk about how you could work together to be prepared. At first, most people will have a difficult time believing something like this could happen at all, yet alone believe it could really affect them personally. Consider this. We are constantly warned about impending disasters from El Nino to terrorists, from crime in our streets to market crashes. Yet it seems that rarely are we impacted personally. Many of us have become jaded and cynical with so many false alarms that we become conditioned not to react at all, trusting it will somehow work itself out. Ironically, that is exactly why we have this problem. People aren't reacting quickly enough. It's not that preparing is a huge issue. The concern is that we won't start soon enough. Many will wait until the last minute to think about preparing. Some won't prepare at all. That's what creates a crisis not only for them, but for everyone they come in contact with. Plan to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. The second scenario is more serious, less likely, but some experts think possible, with disruptions that could last up to a month or two. We may not know if this will be a reality until the fall of 1999, but it's good to think about it now while there's still time to do something about it. Putting aside enough cash to take you through a month or two would be difficult to achieve in a short time, but it could be accomplished over a year or so if you were serious about it. That's why you should start now. If you were out of work for a month with no paycheck, what would you do? Dealing with power outages for a month is practically inconceivable for most of us, and though unlikely, the possibility deserves thoughtful consideration now at a time when you can think calmly and clearly. Having enough food, water, and medicine to last 30 to 60 days will be easier for some than others. Those living in small quarters may have to consider other contingencies, like thinking about who you could move in with for a time. Think about those things we talked about earlier, but change the duration from three days to 30 days or longer. If your power and heat were sporadic for a month or so, if you couldn't use your refrigerator or freezer, if the stores had problems keeping their shelves stocked, if the phone acted up and malfunctioned frequently, if your credit cards were rejected and you couldn't use them, if your bank account was in disorder and you couldn't access it for a month, if some of your community services weren't available, 
If your employer was having problems and couldn't write paychecks. If your neighbors panicked and came to you for help. What would you do? Are you or could you become self-sufficient to the degree where you could be proactive instead of reactive? This scenario is not highly probable. But with the limited information we have right now, it is possible. You need to decide for yourself. The fact is, if you prepare and it doesn't happen, you've lost nothing. On the other hand, if you don't prepare and it does happen, you'll wish you had. The third scenario is something we probably can't do very much about. It's a position that a number of experts have taken and one that elicits grave concern. While not trying to create a general panic, these industry experts are suggesting we could be in for serious trouble. They're talking about a major collapse of the economy and infrastructures for up to a year or more. This is highly unlikely because most major businesses and governments are beginning to pull out all the stops to ensure their mission critical systems will continue to operate. Progress is being made every day. With so much at stake, we would hope that those in a position of leadership will do everything possible to avoid that scenario. But considering the insidious nature of the Y2K problem, the embedded chips, interconnectivity, and the possible chain reaction of disturbances in all aspects of our existence, it merits serious contemplation. You should consider what you and your family would do if your employer had to lay you off for an extended time, if public institutions couldn't provide their usual services, if people panicked and started acting irrationally, you should at least consider what you and your family would do given that situation. Much of it is not so different than experiencing the death of an immediate family member or a debilitating illness. These things happen. Though normally they wouldn't happen to all of us at the same time. Regardless of how you choose to view this problem, it's important you give it critical consideration. Do some research and hear all sides of the story. A prudent person prepares for the future. Optimism and preparedness go hand in hand for those who choose to be responsible and proactive. Let's hope and pray this challenge is sufficiently addressed and the problem resolved by those who are in a position to do something about it. But remember, you can help. Dr. Yardini gives some examples. What, what I really think we all have to do is, is take a much more activist approach to it and, and go to the utilities Go to the phone companies, get together with other companies, get together with communities, and put as much pressure as you can to get them to tell you the truth. What really do you have to... I mean, why prepare for uh, blackouts and brownouts if it's not going to happen? Well, go and find out. Find out who those people are in your sphere of influence, on the job, in your schools, in your community, and in your state. Contact them and talk with them. Begin to raise awareness and call for accountability. Talk with your local bank. Ask them if they are Y2K compliant. Find out what they are doing to protect your accounts. If you have investments, check with your broker and agents to find out their Y2K progress. Look for informed and proactive responses, not just an, oh yes, we've got that under control. As an employee, check with your management to make sure they aren't putting off Y2K corrective action until next year. There could be a significant last-minute rush for assistance that will leave many businesses without support. And if you are a small business owner, start now assessing your vulnerability and take action immediately. Check with your insurance carrier. In most cases, insurance companies are taking the position that this is not an insurance issue. It's a business issue because it can be anticipated and fixed if you start in time. Additionally, all of us need to encourage churches, synagogues, and charitable organizations to become aware and prepare. These are the first places people go when they are in need. And finally, prepare yourself so you are part of the solution, not part of the problem. You can be a beacon of light in your neighborhood, an encouragement to others. This potential crisis could help us bring back a sense of community and camaraderie by compelling us to break down the walls that too often separate us from each other. Ultimately, it's not what happens, but how we respond to what happens as individuals and as a society that will determine our future. A great analogy can be found in the memorable disaster that occurred almost 100 years ago, August 15, 1912, 
when the great ocean liner Titanic sank on its maiden voyage. Then as now, people have come to rely on technology to solve all of society's ills. Michael McLaughlin, curator of maritime history at Ulster Folk and Transport Museum, makes this observation. The world was changing very rapidly. It was making people live longer. It was bringing more happiness. And people looked upon technology as a salvation or panacea for everything. A&E host David McCollum explained what occurred. Titanic's passengers shared one quality in common, a complete trust in the future, utter faith in a world they believed was always getting better. Man, through his mastery of technology, was on the verge of creating heaven on earth. In short, he was about to best nature, perhaps even outdo God. The loss of the Titanic marked the beginning of the end of an age of innocence and arrogance. It was a swift and sudden death of a dearly held dream. And yet as that dream died, the human spirit was reborn with a fresh and renewed appreciation of the importance of interpersonal relationships, a shared sense of community, and a deep and abiding respect for our own mortality. What followed was a century of unprecedented change, accomplishment, and discovery. More often than not, the greatest advances we have seen have resulted from the need to respond to enormous challenges. Perhaps now, almost 100 years later, we face the greatest challenge of this or any time in history. Some have gone as far as to suggest that we should take this as seriously as an impending war. If that is true, then we should learn from history. General Douglas MacArthur said this, The history of failure in warfare can be summarized in two words, too late. Too late in recognizing the potential danger of a deadly enemy. Too late in preparedness. Too late in mobilizing all possible forces for the attack. If this were a war, would we be positioned to win? If we are too late, what will you do? Remember, individuals can make a difference. You can make a difference. If we are prepared mentally, physically, spiritually, and emotionally, and are willing to take action, we can begin to turn this crisis into opportunity, an opportunity for greatness. May each of us take that step starting today. And may God be with us. As I was preparing for this Y2K project, I became acutely aware that I wasn't ready for this problem. In fact, I had no idea. But now that I know, I feel like I'm doing the public a service. The reality is we all need to be aware. We all need to prepare and to spread the word. This video is a message to the world. I think every person should see it. This video presentation is part one of your Y2K personal preparation kit. Part two, the Y2K survival guide, is a 44-page workbook filled with practical information to help you prepare for this event. These two items together provide you a firm foundation so you can be part of the solution, not part of the problem.